Okay, we're going to continue with our second lecture today. Uh, the slide says it's the third, but it's actually a mistake because I made some arrangements. Today's topic will be legal and ethical issues in medicine. And basically, we're going to pick up where we left from the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we covered the four basic principles of medical ethics, which is autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. And last class, we pretty much uh, devoted our discussion to the abstract uh, principles, to the abstract uh, thinking in medical ethics. And we made some connection to philosophy. This time, we're going to apply to very specific cases and concrete realities those abstract topics and those abstract principles to very specific situations that you as doctors will encounter in your everyday practice. So our lecture today will cover legal and ethical issues in medicine and uh, as usual you should always keep in mind that all of these topics will be covered in the US MLE. So at the end of the lecture, we'll do some review with some questions that uh, resemble the ones that will appear in the USMLE step one in the ethical section. So let's begin with a very important concept, which is legal competence. I mean, this has to do with the medical, with the principle of uh, medical ethics of autonomy, which we cover in the last course. We have to figure out who is legally competent to make a decision on their own, who is legally competent to be autonomous, and who is not legally competent to be autonomous. So by definition, we think that the people with legal competence are those who have the capacity to make medical decisions on their own. Remember that the principle of autonomy uh, tries to prevent paternalism, that is to say, it tries to avoid making decisions of, on behalf of other adults. So autonomy gives the privilege for everybody to make their own decisions. So anybody who has the capacity to make medical decisions on their own, we're going to call those people legally competent. Now, who's legally competent? Well, First of all, adults over 18, and here the presumption is that once you become an adult, you have sufficient uh, mental capacity to take decisions on your own and decide what is best for you. Uh, this varies across the country, but in most countries, uh, it is assumed that once you turn 18 years old, you become an adult. Now, in the United States, this may be a little bit different, for instance, for driving purposes. Uh, the driving age is 16. But it's also different for drinking purposes. Drinking age is 21. And the age of consent when it comes to sexual relations, I think in the United States it's 16, but it varies across countries. In most countries, it's 18. Emancipated children, they're also considered to be legally competent. Remember that there are various ways to be emancipated. That is to say, it's basically emancipation for children. It's pretty much like a divorce from parents. I mean, parents no longer are the guardians of children. So those children that are legally considered to be emancipated, that they are no longer under the guardianship of their parents, they're considered to be legally competent to make uh, medical decisions. But also, a judge may declare a person to be legally incompetent because of mental illness. So, even if you're over 18, if you have a mental condition that does not allow you to make a proper decision about what's best for your own health or for your own body, then a judge may declare you legally incompetent. Now, this is usually patients that are suffering from some psychotic disorder, that is to say that they're not in touch with reality, so they don't really have uh, the, the mental capacity or uh, sufficient information to understand what is best for them. People who are also intellectually disabled, or as they used to be called, uh, mentally retarded. But last lecture, we also covered some other cases, people who have Alzheimer's, people who, have, uh, who are suffering pro from post traumatic stress syndrome. In all those cases, it could be that you're not uh, mentally fit 
to make decisions on your own. So in those cases, a judge may declare a person legally incompetent. Informed consent. Well, we also covered this in the previous lecture, but we'll review it here. And this is uh, also very important. For every medical procedure, a patient must sign a consent form. In that form, the patient agrees with the procedure that the doctor is recommended for them. The patient must understand the implications. And last lecture, we talked about how important it is for the language of the informed form, of the informed consent form, how important it is for the language to be clear. I mean, we sign papers all the time without really knowing what they are. But here, this is something very delicate. Uh, uh, the, whoever signs the paper must understand what they're signing. They have to be aware of the risks and the benefits of the action that they are authorizing. And at all times, uh, all the information must be provided to them. It is not ethical for a doctor to withdraw or to hide information from a patient. A patient has to be, has the right to be informed at all times. And for every medical procedure, the patient has to give consent. It is absolutely unethical to proceed on a medical, uh, either a medical diagnosis or a medical treatment or surgery without the consent from the patient. The patient has to agree. Physicians may only waive consent forms in emergency cases when the patient is not able to consent. So yeah, informed consent, it's pretty much a rigid rule, but uh, it can be relaxed in, in, in times of emergency because, of course, there is no time to ask for approval from the patient. If you're, let's say you're in a hospital and there has been an accident and the patient comes in unconscious and you have to perform surgery in, in, in order to, serve, to save the patient's life, well, obviously, you cannot ask uh, the patient whether or not he agrees to that surgery because there is no time. It's an emergency. So the doctor may waive consent forms, but only in emergency cases. And of course, that's when the patient is not able to consent. For everything else, the patient must give uh, consent. For pregnancy, this is a little bit tricky. Uh, pregnancy, pregnant woman must also consent in order to proceed with that procedure. But the thing is that it, from an ethical point of view, it's a little bit tricky because one may consider that there are two people in a pregnant woman. There's a woman and the fetus, if we agree that the fetus is a full person. And that's a philosophical discussion that we'll cover at some maybe next lecture. But for the time being, let's assume that, yes, of course, it is a person with rights, as it is established in many states in the, in the United States where abortion is not uh, allowed. So what to do in those cases? Well, certainly a, preg a pregnant woman must also consent to any procedure that's going to be done upon her. A pregnant woman has the right to refuse interventions, for instance, uh, a cesarean section, even if the fetus will die or be seriously injured without the treatment. So let's say a, a pregnant woman comes in and, you know, normal vaginal delivery might be dangerous and you recommend this pregnant woman that she, she should uh, be, she should uh, allow for a cesarean section. And let's say that she does not give consent and you tell her, well, but look, there is a danger or there is a risk that uh, your baby will die or he will be injured if you do not conform to this procedure. If the woman still refuses, then you're not able to proceed without her consent. Ethically, she has the last word. So, pregnancy, in pregnancy, the woman has a priority over the physician when it comes to deciding what the treatment is going to be for her. One may argue that uh, by doing so, the woman is putting at risk not only her health, but also the health of the fetus. But again, from an ethical point of view, she has the last war. Even if the fetus will be injured or, there are, or there's a high risk of injury, if she does not submit to any specific procedure, she still has the last word. 
And there are also other tricky situations. For instance, must a doctor forbid a pregnant woman from drinking or smoking? As you know, there is fetal alcohol syndrome and smoking uh, causes uh, a lot of damage to the fetus as well. Should a woman be forbidden from doing that? Well, unfortunately, from an ethical perspective, she also has the autonomy to do whatever she feels like. I mean, a doctor should recommend her not to smoke and the doctor should uh, make the woman see the dangers in smoking to the health of, of the fetus. But there is no legal or even ethical way to stop her from doing so. I mean, she's, do she's free to do with her body as she pleases. If by doing so she injures the fetus, well, unfortunately, there's nothing that the doctor can do about it. He has to allow it. But, of course, make no mistake. Uh, smoking and drinking during pregnancy is very dangerous. It poses a very high risk, so it's highly not recommended. But the most the doctor can do is to recommend. He cannot force, he cannot ask for a court order to make the woman stop smoking. Because, I mean, even if the court, even if the judge issued an order that uh, forbade the woman from smoking, this is going to be absolutely impossible to enforce. I mean, <laughs> She could wake up in the middle of the night and she could have a cigar or, or a drink and, you know, the police will not be able to enforce this. It's different from a surgery, for instance, where, you know, uh, in the case of, of a minor that has an accident and the parents refuse to have a blood transfusion because they are Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, in that case, the judge can pretty much issue an order and that's easily enforceable. But in the case of smoking and drinking during pregnancy, it's really useless. I mean, there's no way to stop a woman from doing this other than suggesting. And, of course, that's the most that the doctor can do. In all these procedures, it's very important to inform the patient. And in every medical procedure, whether it's the diagnosis or surgery or beginning a pharmacological treatment or, or a program exercise, anything, the, patient, the doctor has to be completely honest with the patient. So informing the patient is, a, is an absolute ethical necessity. When it comes to information, remember that there is the issue of confidentiality. So the doctor is only concerned with the patient. And that, this is why it's so important to develop a strong doctor-patient relationship, because there will be confidence. There will, be, there will be confidentiality and there will be secrecy between the two. If the patient does not authorize the doctor to discuss the detail of his case with other people, whether it be other doctors or other relatives or friends, then the doctor has to comply with the patient's request. So the doctor is only concerned with the patient. Other family members are irrelevant. Of course, here we're talking if the patient is an adult, if he's legally competent. If the patient is not legally competent, then other family members are relevant indeed. And in the case of children, well, the guardians or the parents will be the ones who are concerned with this. But taking that apart, if the patient is an adult, other family members are irrelevant. It doesn't matter if it's the parents, it doesn't matter if it's the children, it doesn't matter if it's uh, the wife or the husband. The patient has to consent for the doctor to discuss the details with other people. If there is a high risk that the patient may react excessively negatively to some information, then the physician must gradually break the news to the patient himself. If the, pa if the patient has not agreed to share the information with someone else, it is not ethically permissible, or it is not ethically allowed to break the news to family members so that they can tell him. No, you have to tell them yourself. If the patient has not allowed or has not uh, consented to you giving information to other people. So you have to be very sensitive. And we, we'll, we'll be talking about this in, when we cover uh, the doctor and patient relationship. I mean, you as a doctor, you have to understand uh, the emotions that come along a negative uh, diagnosis or for, for any given reason. So you have to understand that you have to be very sensitive when you break the news. And if there is a high risk that the patient will react excessively negatively to this,
then you have to be sensitive enough to break the news. But again, if the patient has not consented that you uh, share the details of the case with relatives, then you cannot appeal to relatives to break the news. You have to do it on your own directly with the patient. There's also the possibility that during surgery, a physician may find out about a new problem. If it is not an emergency, then the physician may not proceed. Because remember, for every medical procedure, you need informed consent. And obviously, during a surgery, the patient will not be available to give consent because he will be either under complete anesthesia and even if it's local anesthesia, well, inside the surgery room, obviously it's not the best condition for the patient to consent to a particular uh, procedure. I mean, he may be conscious, but you know, that's not really informed consent. He, he has to make uh, the decision um, after having considered the facts and so on. So inside the surgery room, there is no possibility for a patient to give informed consent. If it is not an emergency, U.S. doctors may not proceed. If it is an emergency, that if you don't proceed immediately, the patient will die, well, then yes, of course. I mean, you may proceed without the consent of the patient, but you have to inform him immediately after the surgery. Nothing can be withheld from the patient. The relationship between patient and doctor must be absolutely clear. No relevant facts should be um, hidden. No facts actually should be hidden regarding his medical condition and the procedures on him. If, and if you make a mistake, and you know there are always possibility for medical errors, you have, even if you correct immediately that mistake, and that mistake is not a big deal, you still have the ethical obligation to inform about what happened. So the patient must get informed consent, or I'm sorry, the doctor must get informed consent from the patient when the patient regains conscience after anesthesia. One may say, well, but look, we lost a lot of time because we waited for the patient to wake up and then he gave consent and then we have to bring him in again in the, uh, to the surgery room. We could have saved a lot of time and a lot of effort and, you know, um, it would have been much easier if we would have proceed immediately instead of asking for consent. And that may be true, but again, autonomy is the most important well, it's one, not, not necessarily the most important, but it's one of the most important principles in medical ethics. So even if it were easier to proceed without the patient's consent, it is not ethically authorized. Okay, let's talk about children. Uh, in the case of children, only the parent or the guardian may give consent to a specific procedure. Emergencies, pregnancies, sexually transmitted diseases, contraceptives, and substance abuse treatments do not require informed consent from the parents, but only from the minor. So, for most medical procedures, a child cannot decide on his own what's going to be done on him or her. The parent or the guardian has to consent. Of course, if the children is if if the child is a uh, is uh, autonomous in the sense that uh, he has been emancipated, then again the parents do not have to give consent. The, the child is considered to be autonomous because he is competent. Now, if the child is not legally competent, if he has not been emancipated, if he is not autonomous, he may still have the right to decide on his own in cases of emergencies, in cases of pregnancy, sexually transmitted disease, or contraceptives and substance abuse. So let's say you have a, in a state where, where abortion is legal, and, or not, let's not talk about, about abortion because abortion is a little bit different, but let's say that a 16 year old comes into the hospital and she wants to do a screening for HIV and she's 16 years old, should she bring in her parents to give consent in order for the doctor to perform a, an exam, an examination uh, 
to screen for HIV? Well, no, because HIV is an STD, it's a sexually transmitted disease, and STDs are not covered in uh, informed concern from the parents. So for STD, children are considered mm, to have uh, autonomy uh, in order to waive the requirement of uh, permission from their parents. Now, in the case of abortion, it's a little bit tricky. It varies according to each state in the United States. In the United States, some states require consent from the parents in order for a teenager to perform an abortion. Other states require only notification. So a parent may refuse, but that's not enough to forbid the teenager from getting uh, an abortion. However, the parent must be informed. And other states only require consent from the minor. So the parents do not have to be notified and they do not have to consent. Now, parents may refuse treatment for children due to religious or personal reasons. And there are many cases of this. Probably the most famous is a Jehovah's Witness. As you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, they are not allowed uh, to receive uh, blood transfusions. So if there will be a medical procedure uh, where a person may receive a blood transfusion and that person is a member of Jehovah's Witnesses, well, that person could uh, ask the doctor not to proceed with a blood transfusion, even in cases of emergency. In cases of children, it's a little bit different. I mean, parents may refuse treatment for children due to religious or personal reasons, but if it comes to an emergency or a life or death situation, a physician can get judge orders, and even immediately, for life-threatening illnesses or accidents. So let's say a parent, a Jehovah's Witness, doesn't want uh, his kid to receive a blood transfusion, but if he doesn't get that blood transfusion, the kid will, there is a very high risk that the kid will die. Well, the physician may proceed by requiring a judge order, and this can be in a very short time, even within hours, even less. Uh, and if the judge orders, uh, uh, if the judge order allows for the, the, the physician to administer a blood transfusion, even against the wishes of the parents who are Jehovah's Witnesses, then the physician may, may proceed. But what about refusal? of treatment for non-life-threatening conditions that nevertheless affect life quality. What about, for instance, let's say that a, a minor has a condition that requires therapy, any given therapy, but that therapy is against uh, the parent's religious uh, convictions. Well, it's a harder call because it is not life-threatening. I mean, it's not a life or death situation. But still, if the patient does not uh, conform to that treatment, his life quality may be significantly affected. So what should the doctor do in those cases? Well, it's a harder call, but for the most part, ethics requires that the parents' desires be respected because it's not a life-threatening situation. So in those cases, most likely what the physician is required to do is to respect the parent's wishes. Okay, let's talk about uh, confidentiality. Remember that confidentiality is the secrecy of information between a doctor and a patient. A doctor has to be absolutely clear to the patient about every procedure and diagnosis, but at the same time, the doctor may not discuss the details of the case with anyone else except the patient, unless, of course, the patient authorizes uh, the, the, the discussion of the case with other people. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a written form. I mean, if a patient comes in with his wife to the doctor's office and they go in together, well, I mean, you're safe there assuming that uh, the patient's wife is allowed uh, to listen to the details and that the, the patient is given consent for that. But other than that, confidentiality must always be kept. However, there are a few cases when confidentiality may be waived. First, it may be waived when there is suspected child care 
uh, child neglect or abuse. Uh, and remember, we already talked in the previous class about what are some of the signs of uh, child abuse. Uh, there's first of all uh, sexually transmitted diseases. If a child has an STD, um, and it's highly likely that that child was abused, so you should report it. If a child shows signs of malnutrition, that's obviously that's also a sign of uh, neglect and child abuse. And if a child has poor grooming, poor hygiene, that's also a sign of uh, child abuse and neglect. So you are under the obligation to report those cases. In those cases, confidentiality may be waived. Confidentiality may also be waived in cases of suicide risk. If you have the suspicion that the patient is suicidal and that the patient may pose a danger to himself, well, in those cases, you may alert either the relatives or someone else about what's uh, about the dangers uh, that are being posed uh, and you know maybe taking some preventive actions uh, to avoid suicide risk because obviously here uh, the most important uh, principle is saving the patient's life and if that requires to waive confidentiality then you know ethicists agree that uh, the most sensible option is to for, is to waive uh, confidentiality in order to prevent a patient from uh, taking their own lives. And this also applies when it comes to threat to other people. If you have the suspicion, this is this is especially true in psych in psychi psychiatric uh, patients. If you have the suspicion that one of your psychiatric patients is about to harm someone else, either to kill that person or to uh, injure them or whatever, well, you should, uh, you're allowed to discuss the details of the case with other people in order to stop uh, that patient from doing that. So when it comes to threat to other people, you are allowed to waive uh, confidentiality. Because there is also a duty to warn, and in medical ethics, this goes back to a famous case, which is the Tarasov case from 1968. There was a gentleman from India who was living in the United States. His name was uh, Prosenjit uh, Potter. He suffered from paranoid schizophrenia, and we'll get back to schizophrenia in some future lecture, but basically schizophrenia is a psychotic disorder when patients uh, lose uh, touch with reality. And if it's of the paranoid kind, well, those patients believe that uh, they're being persecuted by other people, that other people are out to hurt them. And these patients may become dangerous because in their paranoia, they may harm other people because they are actually thinking that they're being persecuted by other people. So this man, this gentleman, Prosenjit Potter, uh, he suffered from paranoid schizophrenia and he told his, psycho his psychologist that he wanted to kill his former lover, a girl with the last name of uh, Tarasov. Now the treating psychologist, his name was Dr. Moore, after having heard this from his patient, he recommended that Potter be detained because he was posing a danger to his former girlfriend. And he filed a request for detention. And in fact, uh, Mr. Potter was detained for some time, but he was eventually allowed to go free. Now, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Potter wound up killing uh, Mrs. Teresa. So from that case, the courts ruled that doctors have a rule to warn the intended victims. In those cases, you may waive confidentiality but only in those cases. If a patient does not oppose a threat to someone else or to himself, then no, you still have to keep confidentiality. And if a patient poses a threat to himself, then you only can tell those people that are able to do something about it. Those people usually are the relatives that may put the patient on some form of suicide watch, or in the cases of uh, intended harm to other people, then you're only allowed to tell either the police or the intended victims. So this is the duty to warn, and it's an ethical uh, requirement for all doctors. There are also other cases of illnesses where confidentiality is allowed to be waived. There are some reportable illnesses. If you're in a hospital and a patient comes in with any of these illnesses, uh, 
you are allowed to waive confidentiality and report them, but it's only for statistical purposes. Uh, as you know, governments uh, have epidemiological departments where they keep the statistics of uh, important diseases in order to control them. So it's important for these departments to keep up the numbers. So every time a doctor uh, uh, gets a patient with any of these diseases, he has the duty to report them, but only for statistical purposes. These illnesses are infectious diseases, such as varicella, hepatitis, measles, mumps, or rubella, salmonellosis, uh, tuberculosis, and also sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, AIDS, however, not necessarily all HIV positive status. You only have to report when the HIV positive status has already become uh, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, you know. But if a patient is HIV positive but has not developed AIDS, then you do not have the duty to report. And in fact, you should keep confidentiality. Uh, you also need to report syphilis and gonorrhea. Those are the reportable illnesses. Chlamydia is a sexually transmitted disease, but it is not among their reportable illness. So unlike uh, gonorrhea or AIDS, uh, you do not have to report uh, chlamydia. If the patient is 15, then he or she is presumably sexually active. So in those cases, if the patient uh, wants to discuss uh, the cases with you about uh, any uh, diseases that are sexually transmitted, you have the duty to report them for statistical purposes, but you don't have to report his parents or the authorities or anything else because you are assuming that that patient is sexually active. However, if the patient were younger, suppose that the patient is 10 years old, and uh, there's a suspicion of child abuse or he has a sexually transmitted disease, then the doctor should report it immediately. Now, the difference between a 15-year-old patient and a 10-year-old patient is that you're assuming that if the 15-year-old patient has an STD, it's because the patient is actually sexually active and he has consulted, he has consented to the sexual relationship. Whereas a patient who's 10 years old uh, obviously has not consented to a sexual relationship and in those cases there is a suspicion of child abuse. As I was saying, uh, HIV and AIDS are different and they're different when it comes to confidentiality. So if a patient is HIV positive, the doctor is not required to inform as long as the patients follow infection con control procedures. Unfortunately, if you have HIV, you, have, you are responsible for protecting other people from getting uh, this virus. So if you're sexually promiscuous and you're not uh, protecting yourself with condoms or if you are addicted to some form of uh, substance abuse and you're, shedding, you're sharing needles with other people, then in those cases you're not following infection control procedures and in those cases the doctor has the obligation to waive confidentiality and report those cases. However, if you do follow infection control procedures and you are HIV positive, then the doctors do not have the right or they are not required to inform the authorities of, or other people about your condition. A doctor should never refuse treatment to an HIV positive patient, although he's not allowed, he's not forced by law to do so. So let's say uh, you're a doctor and a patient comes in and he wants to be treated and you find out that he's a, he has HIV. Well, for immediate care, for emergency care, yes, of course you are forced uh, to treat him because, uh, you know, that's what the law requires in, in cases of emergency. Now, in cases that are not emergency, uh, it's not ethical for you to refuse treatment, but you are allowed under the law to uh, refuse treatment. So let's say that it's unethical but legal to refuse uh, treatment to a patient because that patient has a uh, HIV. Also, no one can be forcibly 
forcibly tested for HIV, not even pregnant women. So for HIV screening or to, to run some lab tests to decide whether or not you're HIV positive, uh, the patient has to give informed consent. Now, if a doctor is aware of behavior from an HIV patient that puts other people at risk, he must report it. So again, if you have a patient that is promiscuous and this patient uh, ha is HIV positive and this patient is not uh, protecting himself and he's not following infection control procedures, then you have the obligation to report the people who may be at risk about this patient's behavior. And if the patient asks you not to do it, you still have to do it. So in the case of a man who is HIV and he tells you that he is having sex with his girlfriend and he has not told his girlfriend that he has HIV and he's having sex without a condom, then you are under the obligation to tell his girlfriend about this man's condition and about the risks of having unprotected sex with a patient with HIV. Okay, that's about informed consent. Let's talk a little bit about uh, some cases of autonomy and let's talk about involuntary hospitalization. No one can be subject to hospitalization without their consent. And this is what the basic principle of autonomy uh, tells us. However, very much as in informed consent, there are some exceptions. So when can the principle of autonomy be violated? Well, when the patient is not mentally fit. Uh, if the patient poses a threat to himself or to others and he is out of touch with reality, well, in those cases, the patient may be involuntarily hospitalized. Now, there are some critics of psychiatry. There's a famous doctor, Dr. Thomas Sass. He was one of the founders of the anti-psychiatric movement, although he was a psychiatrist himself. These people say that there should never be any form of involuntary hospitalization, never at all. But uh, this is questioned by many medical ethicists because there can be some situations where a patient uh, is uh, psychotic and he's not being he's not able to be placed under control by anyone else and if a patient's behavior poses a threat to other people or to himself well in those cases but they're only emergency situations in those cases uh, it is ethically allowed for the patient to be involuntarily hospitalized now even if the patient is involuntarily hospitalized it shouldn't be more than 60 days and even if the patient is involuntarily hospitalized, he is allowed to refuse treatment. So you may hospitalize him to watch him because he may pose a danger to himself or to others. But even in those situations, the patient is allowed to refuse any pharmacological or psychotherapeutic uh, treatment that you would recommend on him. And in fact, there is a very famous movie about this. Uh, Perhaps some of you have seen it uh, with Jack Nicholson. The movie is One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And uh, this is a movie about a, a criminal who pretends to be uh, mentally ill in order to not go to jail and instead be uh, sent to a uh, psychiatric hospital. But over there, when he goes to the psychiatric hospital, uh, he encounters that the medical staff is uh, very nasty and eventually he causes a lot of trouble and the medical staff uh, in order to control him they perform some involuntary treatments on the patient which is a Jack Nichols character and uh, eventually uh, the most serious involuntary treatment that they perform on this patient is a lobotomy now a lobotomy is a it used to be a surgical procedure where the frontal lobes were disconnected and this was supposed to have a calming effect on the patient and yes indeed it calmed them I mean they were not as aggressive but it you it significantly impaired their cognitive uh, functions so uh, this procedure both the lobotomy and the involuntary treatments in a psychiatric institution uh, 
uh, are deeply unethical and they're never uh, ethically authorized. So involuntary hospitalization may be ethically allowed for emergency situations, but no more than 60 days, but neither treatments or lobotomies are allowed. And here's a picture of a lobotomy. They used to introduce an eye speak through the eye. It was, it was pretty brutal. They would introduce an eye speak through the eye and they would uh, try to cut off some of the circuits in the frontal lobe of the, the frontal lobe uh, area of the, of the brain and you know their expectation was that this would uh, calm the patient because the circuits would, would be cut off and you know some of them were successful in that regard but again uh, there was a significant uh, cognitive impairment and you know it's a very dark chapter in the history of psychiatry and uh, today, no lobotomies are performed. This is different from uh, electroconvulsive uh, therapy, which is uh, more controversial, but uh, from an ethical point of view, most uh, physicians are allowed uh, to perform them in special cases, whereas lobotomies are never allowed anymore. Um, they used to be popular in the past, but uh, they're not allowed anymore because um, people have come to realize the dangers of, the, of these procedures, uh, the significant uh, harms that they create and also that most of the time these procedures were performed without the patient's uh, approval. Okay, let's talk about advanced directives. Uh, advanced directives are instructions given by patients in anticipation of the need for a medical decision. So let's say a patient uh, is about to have a surgery and he's saying, well, look, in case that uh, I don't wake up or I stay in a coma state or I am not uh, mentally fit to make some decisions, in advance, I will say what I would want the doctors to do to me. So those are advanced directives. There are instructions given by patients in anticipation of the need for a medical decision. There are also the, what's called some documents that are called durable power of attorney. And this is a document in which a competent person designates another person as her legal representative to make decisions about her health care when the person can no longer do so. So this is different from an, uh, an, uh, an advanced directive because the patient himself is not given the advanced directive. But he's saying that if the time comes when the patient is not able to take a decision on himself, he designates another person to make decisions for them. And there's also the living will, which are the specifications about what should be done with the person regarding healthcare, which is you know, pretty similar to an advanced directive. Now, what can you do in the case that the, there are no advanced directives? Well, there are the surrogates. If there is no advanced directive, so let's say a patient uh, falls into a coma and he left uh, no advanced directives or no durable power of attorneys, well, who's going to make the decisions about that patient's uh, health care? Well, if there is no advanced directive, the judge will designate a surrogate who should decide on the basis of what the patient would have liked. This is very important. I mean, it's not about what's... Uh, the, the most convenient procedure. No, it's actually keeping in line with what the patient would have decided. If the patient regains consciousness, then the surrogates are no longer in effect. Because of course, I mean, both the surrogates and the durable power of attorneys are in cases that the patient is uh, no longer conscious. But if the patient regains consciousness, then the autonomy goes back to the patient himself and once again the patient has the power to decide what uh, to do with his body what treatments to follow and what treatments not to follow okay let's talk now about a very controversial topic in ethics in medical ethics which is death and euthanasia when it comes to discussions about death in the terms of medical ethics uh, we still we, we have to define what is death and, you know, historically, the, this has not been easy to do. But for the purposes of the medical profession and medical ethics, uh, 
and we can define it as the irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brain stem. So the criteria that the physicians use in order to declare a person to be dead is brain death. Um, once brain death is declared, then doctors may remove life support after the patient is dead. It doesn't matter if the relatives uh, tell you, well, but look, you can keep him connected and please do this. No, if the patient is, uh, has a brain death, then the doctors are allowed to remove uh, life support. And over here, you have a picture of uh, a brain scan of what the normal consciousness looks like. You see that, you know, how all those areas are activated and what brain death looks like. Once you have brain death, is to say once you have this state over here where uh, you know the, the brain does not respond with any activity then in those cases you are authorized to legally declare a patient to be dead and you do not have the obligation to continue life support euthanasia is a uh, is also a tricky situation when it comes to medical ethics perhaps you've seen on the news uh, how many about how many years ago there was a doctor in the united states dr kevorkian he was from Michigan. He spent some years in Michigan. I remember when I was a teenager, uh, he was uh, in the news because of this. He was a doctor that practiced euthanasia, and he was sent to jail uh, quite a number of times because of that. Uh, euthanasia in the medical profession is considered a criminal act. Uh, because even if a doctor asks you, even if a patient asks you to put an end to his life, remember there is a conflict uh, between autonomy and non-maleficence. So the patient may decide to die and he may ask you to help him to die, but remember that the principle of non-maleficence is more important than the principle of autonomy. So it's always first doing no harm. So even if the patient asks you to kill him, to do a harm to him, uh, autonomy, uh, non-maleficence requires you to abstain from doing that. So if a patient asks to die, a physician must not give in. You cannot actively kill a patient even if you think that the patient is going to stop suffering. And it may be true, and it's open to ethical debate, but for the time being, ethical codes and legislation in the United States uh, does not allow for active euthanasia. That is to say, for the act of intentionally killing a patient, even if the patient has required you to do so. However, if a patient refuses treatment, including artificial support, then you should not apply uh, life support because you should respect the patient's autonomy wishes. So there is a difference between passive euthanasia and active euthanasia. In active euthanasia, you deliberately try to kill the patient even if the pa when the patient asks you to do so. But that's violating the principle of non-maleficence. Now, in passive euthanasia, is different because it's you stop giving a patient treatment complying with the patient's wishes. Now, passive euthanasia is not a criminal act. Active euthanasia is a criminal act. So there's a, there is a difference from deliberately giving a patient a substance so he will die from deliberately withdrawing support or treatment from a patient because he has asked for it. That would be passive euthanasia, and that is not uh, criminally prosecuted. Of course, it has to receive the patient's uh, approval. So even if, if, if the euthanasia is pass if passive, uh, in order for it to be legally authorized, it has to be uh, approved by the patient himself. Uh, this is a map of uh, where euthanasia is legal. Uh, as you can see, uh, in some American states, uh, in Colombia, in some European countries, uh, and in a, in a province of Australia, uh, in some countries it used to be legal, illegal, now it isn't. Uh, in some countries it used to be legal, and now it's illegal. And it's a topic that's uh, very open to uh, ethical discussions. Um, I think the tendency will be that in the future more and more countries will allow uh, euthanasia, and I'm talking here about active euthanasia, uh, well, because 
you know, if a patient asks for it and he wants to die, well, then perhaps uh, uh, the doctor should comply. And, you know, here the tricky part is uh, how to balance, uh, as I said, the principle of autonomy with the principle of non maleficence Okay, let's talk about uh, medical malpractice. Uh, medical ma malpractice is the harm uh, to patients as a result of action or inaction from a doctor. And it's made up of four elements. First, there is negligence, that is to say, not uh, performing a medical procedure appropriately. Uh, there is uh, the factor of duty, that the doctor fail his duty. There have to be damages in order for it to be a malpractice. I mean, the patient has to suffer. And there is a directness. The doctor is the sole responsible agent for uh, malpractice. A doctor cannot uh, blame someone else about it. Um, there are various specialities in medical practice that are uh, at most risk of negligence. Obviously, surgeons. I mean, a lot of things can go wrong in surgery. And anesthesiologists. Uh, yeah, I mean, when you perform, when you put some people on anesthesia, there is always the danger of them not uh, recovering, not waking up. So these are the two medical specialties that are at the greatest risk of negligence. The specialties that are at the lowest risk are psychiatrists and family physicians. But there are still risks. I mean, in, in psychiatry, as in the case that we talked about previously, if you have the duty to report uh, about a patient who may pose a danger to other people and you do not report it and that patient kills someone else then and that would be a case of medical malpractice so just because psychiatry doesn't seem to have a high risk doesn't mean it's absolutely free of uh, risks of uh, malpractice no there are some risks involved uh, most negligence cases are civil not criminal that is to say, the state will not prosecute a doctor for medical negligence unless uh, the injured party or the patient uh, files a, a report and presses charges. Uh, patients can sue, but it's not expected that doctors will go to prison. Usually the way that this is uh, solved is by paying some compensation. At least that's the way it works in most countries. However, in severe cases where the doctor uh, is, uh, was negligent due to intoxication, then in those severe cases the doctor may be liable to punishment and he may go to jail. So let's say a doctor is performing a surgery and you know he makes a very big mistake and that significantly impairs the patient. Um, and it is proof it is proven that the doctor was under the influence of alcohol or drugs well in those cases i mean uh, it's the state may uh, file legal action against the doctor and if proven guilty he may go to jail but again those are severe cases for most cases uh, uh, usually the arrangement is a civil procedure whereas where where the parties uh, come together for some compensation, not a criminal punishment. All right, sex with patients. Uh, <laughs> this is always an interesting area. <laughs> Sexual relationships between patients and doctors are forbidden. In some ethical codes, it's okay to have sex with former patients, but never with current patients. In the case of psychiatry, uh, psychiatrists are forbidden from having sex with either current or former patients. And why is this the case? Well, because first of all, it can interfere in the correct uh, treatment that a patient will follow. So maybe the patient will not be uh, in the best position to make informed consent and to make the best decisions about themselves if they are uh, romantically or sexually conditioned by their own doctors. And also because in the doctor-patient relationship, uh, the, the doctor always have a, has a stronger position. I mean, the differential of power is in favor of the doctor. The doctor has great power of the pa over the patient. Now, if the doctor uses that power in order to profit sexually from that relationship, that would be very exploitative, very unethical. So that's why it's considered that sex with patients uh, 
uh, at least under uh, current uh, relationships, should not be allowed. And for past relationships, well, in the case of psychiatrists, it wouldn't be allowed either because uh, psychiatry is a special branch of medicine in doctor-patient relationship. So, you know, there's always a danger of exploitation, even if it's a past uh, relationship. And finally, let's talk about impairment. Uh, well, sometimes doctors may be impaired. Uh, and doctors may be impaired due to, first of all, substance abuse. If a doctor is addicted to cocaine or alcohol or any other uh, substance that is abused, then he may be impaired. The doctor may also be impaired due to physical or mental illness. Remember, you as doctors, uh, you have the power over life or death of, over your patients. So this is a very, this is a profession that has a lot of responsibility. And if you're not physically or mentally fit, to perform, then you may be impaired by your colleagues and you know your license may be removed. And also, uh, you may also be impaired due to advanced age. Yes, uh, your cognitive uh, faculties may be deteriorated. And even your physical faculties, if you're a surgeon, they may also be deteriorated and that may impair your performance. And in those cases, you may be legally impaired from the profession. If a medical practitioner learns about substance abuse from another physician, he must report it immediately. And you should never buy the it's none of your business argument. So if you find out that uh, one of your uh, partners in a medical rotation or at a hospital uh, comes uh, drunk to work, then you should immediately report it. And if the doctor tells you, well, look, don't do it because that's none of your business. No, that's not an argument. You have the duty to report it. Uh, and, you know, uh, this should go, uh, this should be more important than any friendship that you have with them or any other factor. I mean, it is your duty. And if you, and if, it, and if, if, if they find out that you knew about it and you did not report it, you're also liable. Okay, so that wraps up our lecture today. Before we finish, let's uh, do some uh, review questions in the style of US MLE in the section of ethics um, where you will find questions such as this. So let's consider the first one. A 60 year old man has a suspicious mass biopsy. He's clearly mentally competent, but he has been very depressed over his wife's recent death. His daughter asks the doctor not to tell the patient the diagnosis if the results show a malignancy because she fears that he may kill himself. If the mass proves to be malignant, what should the doctor do? Should he A, follow the daughter's wishes and not tell the patient? Should he tell the patient the diagnosis immediately? Should he tell the patient not to worry and that he will be well cared for? Should he ask the patient when he would like to receive the diagnosis or should he have the daughter tell the patient the diagnosis? Uh, well, let's consider each one of the alternatives. Uh, I think uh, the most uh, reasonable one here is ask the patient when he would like to receive the diagnosis and once the patient is calm, then the doctor should break in the news with uh, enough sensitivity. Uh, it is not allowed for the doctor not to tell the patient the diagnosis because, you know, there, has always, there always has to be transparency between a doctor and a patient. The doctor should not tell uh, the patient the diagnosis immediately because there is the danger of the patient killing himself as the, as the daughter told him. So, you know, this has to be uh, very, this has to be done with a lot of sensitivity. And... If the patient has not allowed uh, the daughter uh, to receive the information or he has not given permission to the physician to share the details of the case with the daughter, then the doctor should not tell the daughter's patient about the diagnosis. So the best option here would be D, asking the patient when he would like to receive the diagnosis and once the patient is ready, then proceed with that. Okay, let's consider another one. A 19-year-old man who is HIV positive tells his patient that he is regularly having unprotected sex with his 18-year-old girlfriend. 
The girlfriend does not know the patient's HIV status. At this time, what should the physician do? A, inform state health authorities about the patient's HIV status. No, in this case, he shouldn't. Uh, the doctor should only inform the status of AIDS, but not HIV. B, keep the information about the patient's HIV status confidential. Uh, well, that would be the option to follow if the patient were not having unprotected sex with his girlfriend. But since he's having unprotected sex with his girlfriend and he's not following uh, the control, the infection control procedures, then this option should not be followed. C, inform the girlfriend of the patient's HIV status. Yes, this is what he should do because the girlfriend is at risk and the, in, the confidentiality in this case can be waived in order to protect the girlfriend. Uh, D, inform the girlfriend's parents of the patient's HIV status. Well, no, because the girlfriend is 18 years old and, you know, she's legally autonomous, she's legally competent, so the parents are no longer her guardians. And E, advise the girlfriend not to have unprotected sex with the patient. Well, I mean, that's always a good advice, sure, but here the most urgent part is to tell the patient about the HIV status of her boyfriend.